All right, Robbie, you want to let them in? Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, holy moly, were you in that last one with the owl boxes? He put the owl box together in about 20 minutes, and it was amazing. I learned things about owl boxes I'd never known. That was really in, uh, uh, interesting and amazing to me. Uh, we now have a double header with, uh, with uh, uh, our good friend, uh, Benny, Benjamin Jacob Schwartz, who is eating a burrito right now <laughs> or something like that. And we will get to him in just a minute, uh, but we have a little bit of uh, housekeeping due just like every time. Uh, we are recording these sessions and so they will be made available on our website, uh, the Morro Bay Winter Bird Festival website in a, a few days if, if we can get our act together. And uh, that'll be interesting to see this up and running. Uh, uh, and some of the ones that I've had to miss for a couple minutes to go down and grab some food. And, and so anyway, we're glad that you're here and uh, we're looking forward to uh, hearing Benjamin. Another housekeeping thing is, uh, of course, we're trying, these are all free and uh, you're welcome to share with all your friends. We've got plenty of space. We've got a Zoom room of a thousand people and we usually have 150 or so. Uh, so there is space for more people. So invite your friends. Uh, we have room for all of them, all of your friends for tonight's sessions and tomorrow's sessions. Um, also, even though they're free, we're trying to uh, take some donations uh, to uh, make up for some of our losses for having to cancel something at the last minute. So uh, the bills are still coming in. The dust has not settled. Uh, but Rosemay, right next to me, is the treasurer. And I'm going to ask her for a quick report, both on uh, maybe bills or, or income. Uh, so, so Rosemay, what's happening right now? And, and uh, give us a quick report. We're working really hard to return everybody's money, so that takes a little bit of time, so we really appreciate your patience, but we're also monitoring um, our PayPal account and our Venmo account and everything, and I'm just so impressed by just the generosity of this community. Um, so far, we've raised about $8,400 in those, in those two platforms, um, plus a lot of people have chosen to forfeit a refund and just uh, forward their registration fees as a donation. So we really appreciate it. Um, feel free to contact us um, via, I, I believe, um, um, uh, go ahead, Bob. Zendesk, yeah, oh. just through Zendesk. And then uh, I'll get the information from other people that are working alongside us. And um, right down there, you'll see the contact yeah. us number. You, you type in questions or problems or concerns there and we will get back to you. Uh, you can also make donations in the bottom left uh, by mail or the bottom right by online. You can go to the Bird Festival and uh, click the link and make a donation online. Or there's cute little QR codes. You can uh, hold up your fancy schmancy's uh, phone and you can make a donation right now. Uh, by the way, we will be burning through at least $10,000 paying the bills of the things we've already spent money on uh, that we won't be able to get back. So the $8,400 that is coming through donations, we're getting closer to get to even, and we'd like to make uh, some more money so we can have a bird festival in person next year. So really appreciate your generosity. Thank you very much. Rosemary, anything else you want to say? Yeah, that's it. I'm looking forward to the presentation. Okay, and today's presentation is by Benjamin. Let's see, Benjamin. Um, Benjamin is often seen as a kid perusing streams and creeks, listening to the trees sway in the wind and exploring those wild and open spaces, eventually falling in love with birds. And it, the, uh, I think that happened during a uh, college trip to Costa Rica. Is that right, Ben? And then since graduating from UC Santa Cruz, Benny has worked as an avian field biologist, an international field guide, a land steward, a wildlife photographer, and he's done this all over the place, Central America, Yosemite, Trinidad, Tobago, 
uh, Tobago, uh, Ecuador, Alaska. In fact, he's even published his own field guide to the birds of UC Santa Cruz. And when he's not pouring over field guides or chasing rare bird sightings, he likes to surf, enjoy mountain biking, rock climbing, yoga, leading outdoor outings for kids and facilitating photography clinics. So he hopes his love of the natural world will come through in these presentations and inspire you to conserve and open, uh, conserve open spaces around you. So Benny, uh, we are looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Jump on in and take over. Thank you everybody for joining. Huge thanks to Chris and um, everybody um, from Morro Bay for pivoting quickly. I, I don't think anyone was excited about not getting to go to a bird festival, but um, here we are. Um, pretty much everything that was shared about me is factual, so that's cool. Um, let's get a presentation going. All right, um, I'm Benny. Um, maybe those of you, I'm Ben Jacob Schwartz. Um, some of you may have met me before. Um, I go birding a lot and I take a lot of bird pictures and I like to share my joy with others. So tonight's presentation is a back to back. I've got Feathers in Flight, which is kind of a general primer on the New World Tropics, and then followed by um, a presentation that's focused specifically on hummingbirds. So um, if you're joining for all two, you're in for an awesome ride filled with learning and hopefully some moments of interesting things. Um, Alrighty, so tonight's presentation is Feathers in Flight, A Journey to the Neotropics. Um, all the media in this presentation um, belongs to me, unless there's credits for otherwise. Um, the presentation will last around 45 minutes, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, I am going to try to stay on time. So let's see how things go. All right, um, so I do a couple of things. Um, for Birds by Beaches, that's my brand. That's kind of my lifestyle brand. I do clothing, um, basically creating nature-inspired clothing to kind of catalyze conversations about um, obviously birds and nature and conservation. Um, for a demographic that like really wasn't being exposed to these conversations, or at least in a way that was appetizing. Um, so I've been trying to bridge the gap between some of like my old school natural history and like biology kind of interests. Um, with like a younger generation of folks. Um, so that's been good. <laughs> um, like I said, so I do bird photography, short little bird videos, et cetera. I do local international birding tours. Um, and then I do the clothes for, for the fun of it. Um, here's a little birding outing I did a little while ago up in Lake Merritt with some peers, um, obviously in Oakland. Um, prior to the pandemic, I was rolling out um, this awesome program for businesses to help support their employees with mental health um, and feeling a connection to nature, even in urban spaces um, where I live in Los Angeles. So um, that's kind of on been waylaid now, but um, currently I work full time for an outdoor I run an outdoor education organization in LA called BioCitizen, um, where we do all kinds of stuff from after school enrichment programs to overnight camping and backpacking um, to family ecology walks. So I live and breathe the outdoors and it is kind of my life's purpose to help connect others to the outdoors with the, with the hope that they, uh, they give a shit about protecting it, um, frankly. <laughs> all right, so here we go. What are the neotropics? Well, the neotropics, obviously neo means new, new world tropics. It's obviously from like a colonial perspective, right? These lands have been here for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. People have been living here, so they're not technically new, but for the sake of brevity, we will continue to refer to them as the neotropics. Um, tropical regions throughout the globe are basically sandwiched between here, the Tropic of Cancer, um, and the Tropic of Capricorn. Um, obviously, there's other areas like in South America below that line that are like maybe field tropical or subtropical or whatever, but technically these are the tropics. Um, and a little bit about my presentations and their style, I generally start pretty broad um, to give focus a chance to kind of grasp some of the terminology so that everyone's on the same page. Um, and then I dive a little bit more into specifics and case studies and research. So that being said, why are we talking about the neotropics? Um, well, I spend a lot of time there. And also it's a magnificent space for birding. Um, so in Central America, we have roughly 1600 species. In South America, we have roughly like 3400 species. Um, and if there's no species overlap between those two numbers, that's basically like 50% of the global avian biodiversity. So 
just from a birding perspective, um, there's a lot of birds to see in Latin America or the Neotropics. Um, all right, so obviously we saw on that map, that's a lot of, <laughs> that's a lot of land, um, and we're not going to have time to go to all of those places tonight, um, but we're definitely going to have time to visit a couple of them. Um, our first stop will be to Trinidad and Tobago um, in the West Indies. Our, whoopsies, our second stop will be to um, the ABC Islands, a little bit further west to Bonaire, the island of Bonaire. And then our third stop is going to be into Ecuador. Um, here's what Trinidad and Tobago looks like. Here's what Bonaire looks like. Oopsie daisy, go back. Um, and there's what something else looks like. I don't know why it skipped over. Um, and here is what Ecuador looks like in the cloud forest. So again, what do these locations all have in common, right? Aside from the fact that I've been there um, and that they're in the neotropics, there's more than just that. Now I'll give you guys a second to kind of look at the map. There's obviously context clues here. So for those of you guessing the Andes Mountains, um, that is actually correct. The Andes Mountains um, actually connect all three of these locations. So we can see here's Ecuador here. Um, and if you follow um, the Andean Cordillera, like this mountain range, all the way north into northwestern South America, you can see that it actually splits into three locations. It actually splits into three Cordilleras, like three sub ridges. Um, and these ridges all the, go all the way out to northeastern Venezuela. Um, and part of Tobago has underlying geology um, from the Andes. Um, part of Bonaire does as well. And obviously, Ecuador is in the Andes. So without further ado, um, let's head on over. Oh, actually, let's let's stay broad for a second um, and talk about the drivers of biodiversity, right? We looked at some raw numbers, right? Like roughly 50% of global avian biodiversity is found in the New World tropics. But it isn't just by chance that that happened. Um, and so for us to really understand the gravity of that and how how that manifested. I want to talk a little bit about these drivers. So um, first off, equatorial regions have uniform monthly temperatures. OK, so unlike places in North America or farther in South America, um, there's much more extreme temperature variation. Um, so these two, number one and number two, kind of go close, go hand in hand, but basically um, if you have more uniform monthly temperatures, animals, for example, birds can spend more time specializing on things and not having to kind of adapt to a harsher environment. Um, moreover, with the distinct lack of seasons, um, the temperatures are not as gnarly, so birds can kind of get settled in. Um, and in relation to that, um, birds aren't actually forced to leave the tropics um, in these large scale migration events. They can um, basically they hang out year round because the climate is so palatable. Um, another reason why they're so biodiverse is that the tropics actually welcome um, migrants escaping these extreme climate fluctuations, right? Like Alaska or Northern Washington or Canada birds, they're coming down to Costa Rica, for example, um, and vice versa, right? With austral migrants escaping like a Chilean austral winter, et cetera, and are moving towards equatorial regions to, um, to overwinter. Um, and the last thing that I think is really interesting to mention is that um, even in the New World, in the New World tropics, the, the temperature even at high elevation at 14,000 feet is still conducive and warm enough to a wide variety of bird species, including hummingbirds and things like that. Um, but here in California, take for example, if you're in... Um, you know, if you're in the Sierra and you're at 14,000 or 13,000 plus, you know, you'd be lucky to see a gray crown rosy finch or a common raven, et cetera. So in general, per capita, per square foot, there's just more life that's able to, to exist in the new world tropics. And that's part of the reason why it has such a high biodiversity. Um, now, we've got these general ideas, but then there's actually a magnifier that's happening um, in South America in particular, um, but that's also creating higher species biodiversity in, in the New World tropics, and that's the Andes Mountains. And the Andes Mountains are basically a magnifying glass. And so if you look at this photo here, you can see that there's a diversity of kind of there's a diversity of like subclimates and microclimates here in the Andes. And so you can see from the highest peaks here in this frame that there's snow covered glaciers, um, 
snow and glaciers and like rocky talus and then there's like this uh kind of volcanic slope here and then there's kind of like some shrubby kind of ankle high vegetation here and then there's more like kind of chest high ericaceae kind of um, manzanita shrubbery and so just that in the andes alone is just showing how diverse they are even at these higher elevations now the thing that's interesting about the andes mountains is that they serve to um, increase the biodiversity because they separated coastal and Amazonian regions. So back in the day, I'm not a numbers guy in terms of historical dates, but thousands of years ago, before the Andes Mountains had uplifted um, due to basically tectonic activity from the South American plate and the Pacific plate, um, it was one wet, vast kind of flat savanna, um, kind of like a llano, they would call it in Spanish. But basically, after that, um, the Andes Mountains rose up and created a fence or a barrier separating this like narrow coastal strip of Latin America um, from inland Amazonia. And so by doing that, it actually created um, conditions for allopatric speciation, which means that there's a geographic barrier precluding um, a population or a community of animals from mixing. And so say there was 100 of one species and then 50 were on one side and 50 were on the other side of the Andes. Now those two groups are no longer mixing and over time, um, eventually they become genetically distinct and so distinct that they become their own species. Um, that's a longer taxonomic conversation around species and what a species is, but for our purposes, We'll stick with that. Um, another thing that's really interesting about the Andes Mountains is that even on a more micro level, if we look at here, um, we have an elevational key. Um, so obviously, like these lighter parts are the highest elevations, kind of lightest, lightish pink. Um, but this area here, we have the Western Cordillera, the Altiplano, and then the Eastern Cordillera. And so these Altiplanos are also referred to as inter-Andean valleys. Um, and so between the Eastern and the Western Cordillera, there's um, species or there's population separation, which is which is generating conditions that lead to allopatric speciation. And then even within the folds of the same Cordillera, the Andes Mountains are so textured and complex that even valleys um, in the same Cordillera could potentially create um, conditions for more allopatric speciation. Um, so those are kind of like these magnifiers that are amplifying biodiversity that's already underlying because of the aforementioned conditions that we talked about in the previous slide. Um, if that's confusing, we can talk about it at the end, but in general, the Andes are basically a magnifying glass to amplify biodiversity in the tropics. Alrighty, so our first destination is Trinidad and Tobago. Um, this is what it looks like on Tobago at night, as you can see, <laughs> a lot of stars. Um, and for a little bit of reminder context, um, here's where Trinidad and Tobago is. So it's just six miles off the coast of Venezuela. Um, and the thing that's very interesting about Trinidad and Tobago is that, well, there's a lot. Um, one is that it's a dual island nation, meaning that it's two islands, one country. Um, another thing is that although it's in the Caribbean or the West Indies, um, and many of these Caribbean islands, if you've ever been, are have generally low biodiversity um, and are generally what we call karst topography, um, which means that they are um, made up of limestone. And so obviously plants contribute to bird life and underlying geology is a contributor to soil, thus to plants. So um, Trinidad and Tobago isn't exclusively made up of karst topography. So it's actually a kind of a smaller microcosm of what much of South America is. Um, and although it has 472 species of birds, which shies in comparison to places like Venezuela, Colombia, or Ecuador, um, it does have a fantastic um, representation of many of the neotropical families represented. So although it doesn't have a high, as high of species richness within each family, it does offer you like a nice smattering of families um, for those that are interested in kind of getting their feet wet into to neotropical bird families. Um, so that's one thing that makes it really interesting. Um, this is really what it looks like. Honestly, when I went there, <laughs> I was pretty shocked. I, I, I didn't I, I, I didn't expect it to be this beautiful. Um, and so if you've been to other Caribbean islands, for example, they don't all look like this. Um, all right, now we're talking about birds. That's why you're all here, I presume. Um, so let's talk birds. I like hummingbirds, who doesn't? Um, here's a couple. This is the copper rumped hummingbird from the front. And here's the copper rumped hummingbird from the side believe it or not. Um, next up is a brown violet ear. Um, this is actually the least common of 
the hummingbird species found on Trinidad and Tobago, um, but it's generally quite common throughout its range. Um, and then keeping the fun going, we have the crowd favorite ruby topaz, um, black-throated mango, and a white-necked jacobin. Um, for some more close-ups, because these are just ridiculously handsome birds, we have a male ruby topaz, and we can see his beautiful gorget. And I'm going to dive deeper, like I said earlier, into hummingbirds and those topics later. So this is a great kind of get your feet wet with hummingbirds, oopsies, and neotropical stuff. Um, here's a rufous-tailed jacamar, very, very cool bird. Trinidad Mot Mot. Um, this was actually broken out of a bigger group. I think they changed it to like, I think it was like Blue Crown Mot Mot or something like that, or Lessons Mot Mot, and, they, and then they exploded it into six different Mot Mot species um, throughout their range. And so this is the Trinidad Mot Mot, um, which is actually an endemic species, and it's actually best found on Tobago, which is kind of funny given, given its name, but it's a, it's a fantastic bird. Um, blue and gold macaw. What is not to love about macaws? They're fantastic. And uh, I spent a lot of time pouring through field guides and looking at birds and daydreaming and just like hoping, wishing that I'll see something, but weirdly doubting that I'll ever see it for some reason. Um, and the blue and gold macaws were one that I didn't even realize were in Trinidad and Tobago. Obviously, everyone's seen them maybe in somebody's Hawaii photos or whatever. Um, but these are really cool. And like many birds um, throughout the world, their populations are in danger, whether it's from habitat loss or from poaching um, for bushmeat or for um, just animal trade. And so um, it was a real privilege to be able to see these in their natural environment. And one thing that I found was really interesting was where we went to see them, it was actually in a neighborhood. It wasn't like in a preserve or a fancy nature area. It was just kind of like in a, in a, in a, in a neighborhood in Trinidad. And a gentleman drove by and he was like, oh, what are you guys doing? And we were like, oh, we're looking at blue and gold macaws. And he, my buddy Faraz, who's a Trinidad local photographer, conservationist, writer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he was telling this guy, he was like, yeah, my buddy came all the way from California to see these birds. And the idea here is like a lot of people don't understand the value in nature and in preserving animals um, beyond just what they can get in that short term gain. And so this is a huge aspect. I think one of the benefits of ecotourism is that when birders like us come to other countries and we have targets on our list um, and we can't see those targets, um, it creates it creates a buzz because the guides are looking for those birds. And so it just creates like a chain of positivity around that, like it's attributing value to something that was previously devalued because there wasn't like um, an economy around that. So just want to encourage folks like to, to speak up when you ask your guides what you're looking for to let them know that you're like bummed and how can you help um, preserve them and whatever. I had this experience when I was looking for a Nicaraguan seed finch in Costa Rica recently. So any rate, moving on, blue and gold macaws, what's not to love? They're gregarious, they're beautiful, they're parrots. I don't know why I keep skipping. I don't like that. Um, Maybe I need to keep going. All right. Um, here's another really cool bird. This is a savanna hawk. Um, we were cruising through an agricultural area um, and the field had just recently been disked and it had just rained a little bit. Um, and this was a lifer and an epic photo op out of the car. Um, they're just fantastic. Really, really cool birds. You can see kind of the little bit of the wet forecrown here from the rain. Um, here's another hummingbird species. This is the tufted coquette. Um, this is uh, a beautiful bird found um, actually best at Trent, at um, Acer Wright Nature Center. It's since closed, hopefully not for good. Um, but this is a cool bird because you can't get it at the hummingbird feeders um, and you have to visit a very specific area of Acer Wright to go see it. So obviously I went to go see it and I lucked out and got a couple, couple pretty good photos. Um, and I wanted to include this female in here too because Oftentimes, male hummingbirds get a lot of the credit, but uh, feeling, female hummingbirds certainly deserve plenty of their own. So I figure highlight this little lady. Um, like I said, I spent a lot of time in field guides, wishing, dreaming, hoping, doubting, the full circle of feelings. And um, I had a buddy and he was like, hey, man, you're going to Trinidad. You should 
make sure to see Scarlet Ibis. I was like, oh, I think I'm going to. He's like, no, but you should really make sure. Like, there's this one spot where you can see like thousands of them feeding, and it's uh, it's pretty incredible. And I was like, mm, that sounds great. Um, and I asked my buddy Faraz, and I was like, Faraz, are we gonna? What's the deal? And he's like, oh, don't you worry, bud. We're gonna see them. And he was not kidding, folks. We saw them, um, and we saw five thousand of them. So how do you get talk about getting a lifer and then 5,000 individuals in one day? So I'll play this little video. So <laughs> maybe some of you guys are still after the holiday spirit and you're, you can't tell if this is a poinsettia bush or this is a mangrove covered in scarlet ibis. Um, it is the latter. Um, and so at the end of the day, uh, the scarlet ibis all head into roost um, on these mangrove, on, on this one mangrove island. Um, and the reason for that is for predator avoidance. Simply, um, the two top predators in Trinidad and Tobago of scarlet ibis are basically um, peregrine falcons, um, which they could obviously still get them on this little island, but also um, like boa constrictors, like large boas um, are basically the top predator. And so by going out into this island um, to roost um, in, at night, it decreases the chance of predation. Let's see what else we got going on. Um, another really cool bird that I got to see dur during my time in Trinidad and Tobago was the Trinidad piping wand. Um, and at the time I was young and insolent and I was like, Trinidad piping guan, does it really need its own name? I mean, how many piping guans could there be? Little did I know later that year I would meet a common piping guan in the Amazon, which looked virtually identical. Um, so kind of interesting, another topic for another time, but these are um, called Pawe and they are critically endangered and they are endemic um, to Trinidad and Tobago. And we lucked out and actually got to see some, which was really cool. Um, I wasn't sure if we were going to, but Faraz is quite a fantastic birder um, and guide and uh, put us onto them. So that was really cool. Um, one of the reasons why they're critically endangered um, is because they taste so darn good. Um, not speaking from experience, but these are kind of like, you know, arboreal turkeys. Um, and in a lot of places where socioeconomic conditions don't create a lot of opportunity. Um, folks have to turn to resources that are available to them immediately. Um, and they're thinking more on the short term, right? Like most people would never think to, most people would think like 10 times about hunting in a critically endangered species because they have the ability to like, you know, reason and they go to the market and get food, et cetera. Um, but a lot of folks around the world, obviously, as I'm sure most of us know, don't have the same type of luxuries that some of us do here. And so the the natural environment suffers at its expense. And so um, in addition to habitat loss, um, there's a, definitely a lot of predation um, from humans on the Trinidad piping one. So we just went from Trinidad now to Tobago, and now we're on to Little Tobago Island. Um, this is where they shot blue uh, part of Blue Planet 2. And this is where I shot some photos and video of some pelagic birds, including red-billed tropic birds. Now, the red-billed tropic birds are really cool. They're basically um, a mix between gulls and terns, and they have these beautiful streamers, and they're pretty freaking sweet. Um, and they're not the only ones out here. They also live alongside Magnificent Frigate Bird. Um, and for anyone who's heard about frigate birds or knows about them, um, they're kleptoparasites, right? They steal food or harass birds to the point where they can basically steal their food. Um, and they have no problem doing that to the red-billed tropic birds. And so the Magnificent Frigate Birds will like cruise overhead here or wherever out in the open. And the red-billed tropic birds nesting on these like kind of uh, rocky cliffs here. And so they go out to the ocean, get some fish, and then they bring it back. But not all of them have such an easy journey returning back. The magnificent frigate birds are actually keying in on these uh, red-billed tropic birds when they're flying. And they're actually looking for what's uh, looking for their crop. And the crop is basically like a flexible pouch where um, their food is being stored. And so 
when the crop is full, it's called distended. And that means that it's basically expanded or kind of hanging down a little bit. Um, and so the magnificent frigate bird is actually keen on this physical um, physical component of the bird. And so instead of just randomly targeting tropic birds, they're looking for ones that have fish in their throat. And so to get them to give up their prey, they'll basically harass the bird, chase it, whatever. Um, and sometimes they get so aggressive that they'll actually bite the tail streamers and then swing the bird around and spin it around until the bird is like, okay, I've had enough. And it regurgitates its meal. Um, and then the frigate bird swoops in to catch it before it hits the water. Frigate birds are not entirely terrible. They're not uh, obligative uh, kleptoparasites, which means that, that they can choose to be parasitic if they want. Um, they can also hunt for their own food, but I believe they don't have the same type of um, oil on their feathers. So if they get wet in the water, it's, it's much more uh, traumatic for them. All right. So we wrapped up things over in Trinidad and Tobago and we're heading north and west by not much, but the climate and the birds here are very different. Um, so all aboard to the Dutch Caribbean, AKA Bonaire in this case. Um, so Bonaire is pretty sweet <laughs> to say the least. The environment here is very different. It's basically a mix between like Joshua tree, like kind of scrubland and like African savanna, like acacia thorns and, but also like mangroves and like salt flats. It, it's a very interesting place, very small in proportion to mainland South America, but it does have some really cool birds, um, obviously. <laughs> um, here's some Caribbean flamingos in the foreground and uh, a large tricolored heron um, in the side ground. Um, the Caribbean flamingo, yes. It is so famous on Bonaire that the airport is actually named um, Flamingo International. And uh, I believe there's roughly 4,000 um, individuals that nest um, on Bonaire, which is only one of four Caribbean Flamingo breeding locations. So um, despite its small size, it, it plays a very important role in the Caribbean Flamingo population. Um, and this photograph was actually taken from just right off the road, just like leaning against the vehicle that we'd taken out. Um, so they're pretty accessible and they make for some great photo opportunities. Keeping it going with cool birds. Um, this is a member of the Mimidae family. This is a pearly thrasher. Um, very cool bird, handsome, young juvenile hanging out in an acacia tree. Um, not really minding if I snapped a couple photos. Um, here's another hummingbird. This is a blue-tailed emerald. This is like a little lady. You can see some of her pin feathers still coming in a little bit. Um, here's another one. This is a blue-tailed emerald. Um, a lot of folks take pictures of hummingbirds at hummingbird feeders. Well, that makes sense. They're often at hummingbird feeders. Um, but I wanted to highlight the, the landscape and um, the natural habits of the blue-tailed emeralds, which are obviously coming to hit. Um, this uh, this cactus flower. Alrighty, um, another cool bird, Crested Caracara. Um, it's a member of the Falconidae family, um, but it's actually a scavenger. Um, so it's in a different genus than like the true falcons, but very cool bird, um, widespread throughout the New World tropics. This was kind of in a lucky situation. I was uh, I was in the car. We were shooting an osprey feeding on like a fish, and um, this bird came ripping down, uh, ripping down the highway. And I was like, oh shoot, it's coming in quick. And I was like, oh man, grab my camera. And I only had enough time to like take three frames. And uh, this was one of the free three frames that the camera captured. And uh, <laughs> lucky for me, my settings were, were in the right place at the right time. So just a reminder for folks, uh, when you're changing birding spots or whatever, make sure to tune up your settings so that you can hit the ground running and not miss critical shots. Um, another really cool bird on Bonaire is the brown-throated parakeet, um, feeding on some wild grapes. Um, we'll keep it going because we still got Ecuador. Tropical mockingbird on some acacia, very similar to our northern mockingbird. Um, Sora under some acacia. Had to open this up a little bit in terms of the shadows. It's quite dark, but I really like the reflection and kind of the motion in the image very skulky bird, as I'm sure most folks know. Um, Venezuelan trupial. So this bird is actually not from 
bought air. It turns out it's from Venezuela. Um, and I usually don't take pictures of uh, birds and things like that on uh, human made thingamajiggers, but this bird was so dang handsome and it just looked like a painting. Um, so I figured I'd share it with y'all here. And these are Icteridae and the blackbird family. As you can see, they look superficially the Orioles, um, but they're about maybe 30 to 40% larger than the Orioles. Um, and there's some eastern, there's there's also some overwintering shorebirds that hang out on Bonaire. Um, this is obviously an American oyster catcher. This is our eastern North American counterpart to our west coast black oyster catcher. Um, we have these here in SoCal um, as well in Texas, but uh, these are reddish egrets. Um, this is obviously a red morph. Alrighty. Our last and final destination is actually um, has four kind of sub regions that we'll be going over. And so we're going to start at the top and we're going to work our way down to the Amazon basin. Now, the reason I'm choosing this route is to demonstrate the interconnectedness between these habitats. Um, and that's going to be kind of a driving uh, driving memo as I close the presentation um, about migration and where, quote unquote, North American birds spend the winter. Um, and sometimes they're referred to as our birds. And so dispelling that misconception as we dive into Ecuador. So the first stop we're gonna make is um, in the Paramo, El Paramo, um, as we call it in Spanish. It's roughly defined as tropical alpine habitat, which is a little bit counterintuitive, but like I mentioned earlier, when you get into higher elevations um, at more tropical latitudes, um, it takes a while to get to the snow. So it's tropical alpine. Um, and this is just one snapshot of the Paramo. Um, we saw a different snapshot earlier, but as you can see, um, like the ground cover is made up of a lot of bryophytes and even some asters. Um, and then we have some more like bunch grasses and then we have some more like shrubbery. Um, the landscape is very, very diverse in the Paramo. Um, and it's it's quite cool. Generally, it rains most days in the Paramo. Um, and it's it's really cool. There's a lot of unique birds that live there, um, including this sparkling violet ear that was photographed around 9000 feet in elevation. Um, so that's pretty cool. This is like the beautiful cousin to the brown of violet ear. And the giant hummingbird. So like I said, I spent a lot of time in the field guides and I never thought I was going to get to the Paramo. I never thought I was going to get into, you know, habitat to see giant hummingbird and be in the Andes Mountains. And well, <laughs> I was wrong. And uh, this giant hummingbird, the first time I saw it, um, I didn't think I didn't know what I was looking at. Honestly, I was like, is that a swift? It was just it was flying so differently than um, the insect like flight of most hummingbirds that we're, we're used to. Um, and so if there was a Northern Cardinal sitting um, on the same perch, they would be roughly the same size. So um, they're quite large. And uh, we're gonna actually dive into this, this specific bird a little bit more in the next presentation. So hopefully you stick with us and uh, we'll dive into that later. All right, so the Andean condor, obviously the South American counterpart to our beautiful California condor, not the best photo, but who doesn't want to see an Andean condor? Um, <laughs> another bird I literally never thought I would see. Some of them are just so, I pedestal so much in my mind that whatever. But um, if you've seen Planet Earth 2, which I highly encourage you if you haven't, there's a fantastic segment um, or a whole episode called Jungles. And then there's a segment on um, hummingbirds and they do a whole feature kind of um, about the sword billed hummingbird. And it's really a fantastic bird. Um, it's the only bird in the world where the beak is actually longer than its body and the only bird that it actually cannot use its beak to preen or clean its feathers um, and, its, and remove ectoparasites. Um, so instead it uses its feet. Um, here's another look at a perched sword billed hummingbird quite the bird in all categories and it didn't even skimp on the iridescent body feathers i mean can anyone really complain um another hummingbird one of 133 species of hummingbirds found in ecuador is the great sapphire wing um and as you can see the body proportions are actually quite different it's got a relatively short beak um and a relatively large body this is the second largest um hummingbird in ecuador um and uh, yeah, it's a cool bird. Um, Scarlet-bellied mountain tanager is a fantastic bird to say the least. Um, if you spend any time in the new world tropics, um, some tanagers are kind of solo dolo while others are more kind of uh, 
mixed flock, which means that they hang out in groups of different species of birds foraging through um, their landscape. But the scarlet belly mountain tanager is kind of more of a solo dolo bird. Um, this individual rolled up with just one other bird, which I assume was a mated pair. Um, a mythic bird that I never thought I would see. You think I was kidding, but after this trip, I started to believe that I would see more birds in my life than I thought. Um, and here's the rainbow bearded thornbill. Um, I was hanging out in my car um, that I rented on my last day and I was in Antisana and uh, it's in the Paramo. And I was just trying to pick up a last, last couple birds for my trip. And I look over and I saw this, this thing whiz right by me. I was like, what the heck? And it landed on the ground. And obviously I had my camera right next to me. So I pulled out my camera and I was like dropping some frames out the window. And lo and behold, it was a flipping rainbow bearded thornbill. Um, I never thought I would see a bird like this and blah, blah, blah. But um, really special moment. Just kind of one of those moments where you just, just detach from expectations and just present in the moment. And um, I think that's a beautiful thing. And you can see here, obviously, the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet of the rainbow bill. So not the best picture of that field mark, but still a really, really cool bird. Shining sunbeam. This is a really great bird. Fantastic colors in the front, kind of orange um, and kind of this pink, yellow, gold, green kind of iridescence on the back. Really great bird. Um, here's another ibis species. This is a black-faced ibis. Um, and throughout its range in the Andes, it's actually doing quite well, um, except for Ecuador, um, where it has kind of a small habitat and it's fragmented um, from the rest of its habitat. So it's actually endangered in Ecuador, but it's doing fine um, in the rest of its range. So as we make our way down slope and into the cloud forest, um, as you can see, the visual changes quite substantially. Um, instead of kind of low head high or lower shrubs or bryophytes um, on the ground, um, the cloud forest is littered with tall trees, dense vegetation, and high surface area of green. Um, and as you can see here, there's a lot of epiphytes, which are basically plants growing on other plants, um, and not only plants, but um, sometimes mushrooms or fungus, but predominantly bromeliads, um, mosses, liverworts, things like that um, are growing on top. And this is obviously creating like extremely, extreme like ecological heterogeneity, which means that it's just so mixed up. There's all kinds of types of nooks and crannies and space for organisms and life to persist. And within those nooks and crannies, life flourishes. I mean, take, for example, in the cloud forest, you could even find a, you, there's some frogs that actually lay tadpoles inside the water of the center column of bromeliads and the, the tadpoles eat the mosquito larvae in there. So just imagine that one small microcosm and expand it across the whole cloud forest. And so um, this biodiversity goes across all taxa, including um, reptiles, amphibians, insects, birds, et cetera, et cetera. And so the cloud forest is very interesting. It has a daily pattern. Um, this is a short little time lapse I took on my iPhone, um, but the point of it is that it's demonstrating the power of these forests. And so um, when you remove um, forest habitat in this elevation in the cloud forest, you're doing more than just removing habitat. You're actually breaking a part of a very vital part of the cycle. And as you can see in the background, there's actually precipitation or actually um, moisture in the form of like evapotranspiration like basically the trees are sweating out water in the form of cloud vapor um, and it's creating its own climate. So it's not only important to like save the trees from like an environmental standpoint of like oxygen, et cetera, but it's literally contributing to cooling of the planet and maintenance of the climate. So cloud forests are cool. <laughs> um, let's get into some birds. Um, much like the elegant trogan we have in Southeast Arizona, um, this is a masked trogan. Um, the only difference is it's a different species and it lives in a totally different place. <laughs> um, here's a beautiful jay, member of the corvid family. I don't think anyone could argue about that. Um, here's a golden tanager. Um, now, most people, when they come to Morro Bay in the wintertime, for example, they probably see 10,000 turkey vultures and uh, 
potentially soon, quickly kind of, oh, it's just a turkey vulture. And when you go to Ecuador, um, in Northwest Ecuador, the same thing can kind of be said about a golden tanager, which is slightly sacrilegious, but when there's like 1600 species of birds, you gotta, you gotta stay focused if you wanna rack them up. But um, it is a gorgeous bird and it is very common. Here's another really cool hummingbird. This is the velvet purple coronet. Um, I use my fill flash so we can see kind of the iridescence on its body feathers. Um, but this is really what the bird looks like. I'm not sure like what the color calibration looks like on your end, but it's a really saturated purple and blues and kind of whatever. I don't need to describe the colors. Y'all can see them, I presume, but a very cool bird. Um, green crown wood nymph. Um, just gorgeous, just a gorgeous bird. Um, if you think you're good at taking pictures in North America, head to the tropics and you'll see it gets very challenging very quickly. So you have to be patient and use a tripod or um, get lucky. And uh, keeping it going in the cloud forest, we have another Hummer, the Empress Brilliant. We have this beautiful um, Western booted racket tail. Got the boots with the fur. Here's another Hummer. This is a buff winged coronet. Um, a violet tailed sylph up next. This is uh, what we call a choco endemic, um, which is a very special stretch of rainforest found between um, Panama and Northern Ecuador. Um, we're gonna keep things going because we just have a few minutes left. Um, here's crimson rumped toucanet. Um, this is in the Ramphastidae family. This is a small toucan. Um, here's a pale mandible to Arasari. These are significantly larger than the toucanets. Um, and here's a really, really cool toucan. This is the plate build mountain toucan. This is also another choco endemic. Um, and until recently, this bird was very challenging to see or at least photograph well um, because it didn't come down to feeders. Um, but in recent years, uh, folks have been observing um, groups of plate build mountain toucans coming down to uh, banana feeders. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the New World Tropics, um, there's a lot of bird feeding that happens there. Um, and uh, like Arnall, Arnall uh, Observatory Lodge is probably one of the most famous places to see people feeding birds on, on fruit platters. And it brings down a whole smattering of colorful birds. And so um, that's kind of like a layup for birders in the New World Tropics is that they have these opportunities for folks to be able to see them close up without a large trek. Um, and so now the plate build mountain toucan falls slightly into that category, which is cool. Um, and if you look closely, you can see that somebody here has a little bit of imposter syndrome. Um, this is not a toucan, but it is in fact a barbet. This is the toucan barbet. Um, another cool bird, not gonna go so deep. We just have a couple more minutes. Um, flame faced tanager, Andean cock of the rock, um, the Andean foothills. Now we are down slope, it's a bit warmer. Um, it's still humid. Um, but fear not, there are plenty of birds here in the foothills. Here's another barbet species. This is the red-headed barbet, um, pretty wide ranging in, in, in Latin America, um, at least from Ecuador to Costa Rica. Um, here's another trogon species. This is the white-tailed trogon. Very cool. How are we doing on time? Oh, 458. Uh, we're getting, uh, Benjamin, we're getting close, right, but gonna... you've got to I'm going to charge through towards our end so we can hit our closer. All right. Um, Amazon Basin. So of all the places I went in the world, I was not expecting to be uh, so pleased with my time in the Amazon. Um, I was on the, along the Rio Napo, which is a small tribute, which is actually one of nine tribu major tributaries into the main Amazon River, where I was specifically was in Yasuni National Park. Um, one thing that's important to note about the Amazon, it's really challenging birding because um, the trees are up so tall. And that's actually called an emergent canopy. It means that as the trees are continuing to prioritize light as a resource, they keep growing to basically prevent themselves being outshaded. Um, and so here we are back on the forest floor looking for capromulgids like ladder-tailed nightjar, going down to clay licks to see scarlet macaws. Um, and Amazon by boat is just ridiculously beautiful. This is a little backwater section. Um, this is called Blackwater, um, where it's basically not mixing with um, a main river. Um, and so the secondary compounds found in the leaves leach out into the water, um, creating what's called like black water. Um, and there's certain places in the Amazon that, that look like that. Um, and again, we're still in Ecuador. 
um, whoops, some black cap Danacobius, uh, striated heron eating a piranha, um, Kokoi heron, which is basically like a cool great blue heron, um, <laughs> roseate spoonbill, everybody knows that one. Um, burrowing owl was a lifer for my guide. Um, white fronted nun bird, super cool bird. Amazon night sky, Hawatsin, these ancient birds, very cool. Snail kite, horn screamer. All right, so in, in, in closing, basically the point of this talk is cool, great bird pictures. You know, I'm privileged, I get to travel. I'm excited about birds, that's awesome. But what does it mean in the greater context of, of the world and conservation and kind of humans impact on the environment in recent years? So these are obviously migration maps of birds from North America and South America and Central America. And the point here is that a lot of people say, where do our birds go in the winter time, right? Like if you live in northern latitudes where um, a lot of birds are migrating out, um, it's often much quieter in the non-breeding season, although there are year-round residents, of course. But one thing that's interesting is that these North American flyways, there's four majors, um, and they have all kinds of birds that are passing through there, right? You can see the range maps here where they're wintering, they're migrating, they're breeding. Hermit warbler, swains and thrush. Northern water shrub thrush. These are all what we call neotropical migrants, right? This is what people are talking about when they say, where did my birds go? Um, summer tanager, of course, but there's a big misconception here, this idea that they're our birds. And I, I didn't learn that until relatively recently, but many of these birds that are ours are actually spending almost twice as long in their non-breeding um, habitat than they are in our breeding habitat. And so it's important to continue to leverage our privilege in North America and supporting land-based and like joint venture conservation in these areas where they might not have the same type of resources or conservation mindset. Because if a bird is wintering for eight months in Costa Rica and all the mangroves are cut down, um, that northern water thrush, that population is going to be negatively impacted significantly. And so Obviously, we've lost roughly 3 billion birds. This is old data, but I wanted to just make sure folks remember that there are things that we can do to make um, bird populations come back, um, or at least prevent them from declining rapidly. Drinking shade-grown coffee, reduced plastic use, citizen science. These are top two that folks can do really easily. Um, you can ask me questions in the comments later. Um, make windows safer with, with UV decals. Um, keep your cats indoors. I know a lot of birders who have cats um, and the best birders who have cats keep their cats indoors um, because invasive species, including cats, are like one of the number one predators to birds. Obviously, they disproportionately impact certain certain birds. But again, and then nothing's cooler than using native plants and avoiding pesticides. Um, Feel free to take a screenshot. These are all fantastic conservation organizations that are doing really, really good work in the New World Tropics. Um, you can look them up on your own. Um, I don't have time to explain them all, but Save the Choco is a really, really great one. All these orgs are, are fantastic. So I'll leave folks a second to take a screenshot. This presentation will be available later. Um, thank you for your time. I'm, ben I'm Benny Jacob Schwartz, and uh, AKA Birds by Beaches. Hey, hey, Benny, this is Chris. Um, you can uh, feel free to leave that screen uh, back up uh, for right now while we uh, go through a couple of little questions and little stuff. Um, if you have a question for Benjamin, um, now's the time to write it in the chat. We'll try to look through those and uh, give him a chance to answer. Uh, we are gonna um, give Benjamin a chance to uh, go get a drink of water too, because he's gonna come back and do another hour. But right now, um, Go, go ahead and ask it, ask a question or two. Uh, uh, Benjamin, I don't know if you can see, but there's questions in the everyone. Uh, grab, the, grab the ones that you like and, uh, and go, for, go for a couple more minutes. Okay, cool. Let's see, where is everyone? Chat, close, chat. And chat is at below and it's to everyone. Do you see any? Uh, um, okay, uh, let me... Yeah, I can't see any of the questions. Okay, I got, well, I got one here. I've got actually two that are this. Uh, one is, can you speak about the equipment that you used? And the other was, what camera and lenses do you use for your amazing photos? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I thank you kindly. Um, yeah, I shoot all DSLR. Jan Loomis, hey, oh, hey, Jan, what's up? Um, small world. Um, what do I shoot on? 
I can't tell you. No, I'm just kidding. I shoot cannon. <laughs> I have a couple different bodies. It's not mirrorless. I have a 7D Mark II and a 5D Mark III, and then I use a Sigma Contemporary 150 to 600. Just depends on what I'm doing, but sometimes I shoot freehand. Sometimes I shoot tripod. Um, sometimes I shoot uh, with my eyes closed. <laughs> Uh, you, uh, ben, Benny, you mentioned a movie. Can you say that movie again? Was, um, it, um, was it Blue Earth 2 or something oh, like yeah, that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Planet, Planet Earth 2 by BBC Earth or whatever. Planet Earth 2 and uh, Blue Planet are the two BBC documentaries or like nature, nature docs that I was talking about. Great. Uh, you also mentioned a place where you can observe some amazing birds at feeders. Uh, what was that uh, cloud forest or where was that? Yeah, it's really all over the New World tropics, honestly. It just depends on what you're looking for bird wise. But the spot I mentioned in particular is probably the most famous in Costa Rica for like first time birders is and not only first time birders, but um, it's called the Arnall Observatory Lodge. Um, right now there's actually a Rufus vented ground cuckoo that's being seen there, which is like one of the rarest birds in the world. So people are going kind of crazy <laughs> right now. Um, but that's like the spot that I went to as a teenager. And I saw that's like when I first saw tropical birds being fed by fruit. And I was like, what is happening here? This is crazy. Got one more come in here. What, what lens millimeter did you use in Trinidad? And is it very humid there? <laughs> um, so it's not about the length of the lens. It's about the skill of the photographer and the, the luck of the draw, obviously. Um, my setup is relatively old in comparison to like a lot of the mirrorless stuff that's on the market, but it's, it, it's, it's a variety of factors that go into it, right? I know some fantastic photographers that are shooting like wide angle 50 millimeter stuff. And I know other people that are shooting like super long glass, like $10,000 prime lenses that are like 600 millimeter, like F4. So it really depends on what your goals are for photography. Um, if you want to talk about that, like offline, I'd be happy to. Um, I'll put my contact and stuff like that in the chat. Um, and then if you have like questions about like trips or like specific things like that, I'm happy to like consult for folks. Um, if you have any questions about like international birding and I'm, I have a fair amount of contacts for bird stuff. So if that's something that folks are interested in, um, you can catch me offline. Great. Thanks a lot. As hey, you do that, could you put the slide back up of the name of the organizations when you get a chance, Benny? Yes, for sure. Okay, and while, while you guys are looking at that slide, uh, we're going to stall for time to give Benjamin a chance to stand up and stretch, do a yoga pose, uh, and, and can, whatever he needs to do, and uh, uh, let some other people come in who were uh, going to come in at the top of the hour. So we're going to stall for a couple of minutes. Um, but I just want to remind everybody that while, while these are free, um, uh, if you want to make a donation to the Morro Bay, Bird, uh, Morro Bay Bird Festival, you can in several different ways. Also, you know, if, if you've got some extra money, try to think about uh, setting up a trip to Colombia, Costa Rica, or, or someplace else. Uh, several of our young speakers, you know, these are young starving, like, they're like the young starving artist types, but instead of being artists, they're the young starving bird watcher types. Uh, let's try to give some of these guys some business. Take a little trip to Costa Rica or Colombia or Ecuador or something like that. Uh, uh, you can look through the Moore Bay website, uh, um, Bird Festival website, find out some of those leaders. And several of them have their own little bird touring companies, and they would love to take you out. And, and that's really helpful. The other thing while we're stalling for time is, um, as, as you saw those... Um, migration maps uh, that, that Benjamin was showing there. Uh, and we think about our birds. Yeah, the Baltimore, the Baltimore Air, uh, Oriole might not be called the Baltimore Air Oriole where it goes for the rest of its life, right? But that's what we think of it as our bird. But one of the things that I think is important to consider is we are connected. Uh, our birds are connected to other communities and other places. So we are actually connected to places in Costa Rica, Costa Rica, and Colombia, and Ecuador, and Guyana, and, and those connections connect us as human beings through through birds. 
And so I know that may seem a, a little bit silly or philosophical, but our human connections through connections with bird migrations are pretty remarkable. So you should um, do your best to, to hire one of these young starving bird watching leader types and, and go on a trip with them. And uh, you also help the people in the local areas to, um, to make a living, you know? Would you rather have those people eat the birds or get paid to show you the birds? And ecotourism makes a really significant difference to birds and the local communities. Again, they're not our birds, they're their birds. And we share locations on, this, uh, on the planet tied together by a string of, of bird migration. So it's pretty incredible. And that's enough, blah, blah, blah. Uh, for those who just came in, um, what we're doing right now is we're having a fly by the seat of your pants Zoom festival instead of a, a, an on live, a, a, an in-person uh, Morro Bay Winter Bird Festival. We're doing our best to, to pivot and to, to make something happen. And, and it's pretty fun. I have been amazed. I, I, I've been sitting here all day for a couple of days and we'll sit here all day tomorrow. Just incredibly amazed at the quality of the presenters uh, that I would not normally have gotten to hear because I'm, I'm normally leading a trip or two. And uh, we've, seen, uh, we've seen John Muir Law's uh, sketch birds in front of our very eyes. We've seen uh, Tom, Tom Burhan um, create an owl box in front of our very eyes. We've learned about, you know, beautifully feathered birds in the neotropics right here. So it's been a pretty fun time and I hope you're enjoying it. Again, if you can make some donations, uh, depending on your abilities, go ahead and do that several different ways. And uh, now uh, part two, Benjamin, what are you gonna talk about this time? And uh, take as long as you want because there's, uh, oh no, you can't take as long as you want. We have one more program right after ours. Uh, um, Rob, can you put up that next uh, slide for the next program? Hey, the, uh, the power behind the throne is Bob Ravel, and uh, he is going to do the next presentation, and it's uh, about how are we going to be doing bird festivals in the future, and uh, Bob has spent thousands of hours, and the bird festival has spent thousands of dollars putting together something called Bobble Link. It's a new way to run a bird festival, and if you know anybody that's running bird festivals, this is probably be go going to become the standard way to run a bird festival. So if you have any bird festival friends, if you know folks from, uh, I don't know if you realize this, but there's about 250 bird festivals each year in the United States. We're not even, even talking about the world, just in the United States. Um, and so uh, if you know somebody who's involved in a bird festival, the registrar, the administrator, whatever, uh, call them right now and tell them to get online at six o'clock because Bob Ravel is going to do that presentation. Okay, Benjamin, have you have you taken a deep breath, glass of water? You ready to go? Okay, oh, yeah. what are we going to learn about this time? I figure I'll just do the same presentation. I I, I could watch those birds again. That would be pretty cool. Um, no, I'm just joking. Um, where are we? Alrighty. Let me close this one down. Um, okay. Um, tonight, <laughs> for those of you who are just joining us, my name is Benjamin Jacob Schwartz. Um, I go by Birds by Beegis by, from my friends and family. So if you'd like to rapidly find yourself in that category, you can call me Beegis. Um, and tonight, um, we are continuing our journey into the new world tropics. Um, but we're going to focus a little bit more on hummingbirds. And by a little bit, I mean the next 50 minutes. So grab your popcorn or whatever it is you're up to and um, buckle up. So tonight's presentation is called The Marvelous Hummingbird from Sea to Summit. Um, and believe it or not, we are going to go from sea to summit. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to the Morro Bay Bird Festival and to all of its amazing organizers and Chris and and Bob and everybody, like seriously, huge thanks. Um, I know we're bummed that we can't be birding <laughs> together in person, but this is definitely an, a really amazing alternative. So thanks everybody for being here and uh, let's do some things. So a lot of people ask me, what's your deal? What do you do? You seem like an interesting guy. You're obviously quite friendly, but uh, <laughs> what do you do? Well, I do a lot of things. Um, I have my own 
bird guiding business and brand. Um, and one of the things I do is um, I create nature inspired clothing to kind of shift the paradigm around what birding or bird watching looks like and, and who's doing it. Um, and I also try to, my whole thing is basically trying to make birding cool. I think a lot of younger folks are, I try to trick them by the coolness into a very nerdy topic and then letting the magic of birds kind of move them. And then the stigma behind whatever preconceived notion they thought about birding melts away and then they can just be comfortable being outdoors and excited about nature. Um, this is at Lake Merritt in Oakland. Um, I'm gonna rip through here. Um, so I do bird photography, bird videos. Um, I lead local outings and do clothing. Um, that's my side job. I work full time running um, an education organization in LA called BioCitizen Los Angeles, um, where we basically are doing the same things that I mentioned um, in the birding kind of basically the idea is to help humans connect to nature um, and show them the beautiful interconnect intersection of like natural and urban spaces and like helping expose like Angelinos to like the amazing biodiversity that is here in LA, um, including much of our trails and the three mountain ranges that are found in LA, et cetera. And we do weekend backpacking, after school adventures, after school enrichment like hikes. We do um, family ecology walks. We do typical summer camp, like all kinds of stuff. So if you couldn't tell, I live and breathe the outdoors. Um, and uh, here we go. Um, all the media in tonight's presentation is either mine, unless otherwise credited, which there is some in here. Um, and uh, I generally present broadly, and then I dive into more specifics so that um, everybody can kind of get a nice baseline understanding for what we're talking about. So. Let's start off with what makes a hummingbird a hummingbird. Um, is it their evolutionary history? Perhaps. Is it their distribution? Is it, hold on, let me set up my timer. Is it um, their role as pollinators? I'm sorry, I'm just putting my timer. Um, is it their abilities to fly? Is it maybe their size? Is that what's making them a hummingbird? Well, let's find out together. So, because it turns out it's all of those and more. So first and foremost, for scope, there's 300, there's roughly 360 different species of hummingbird. Um, and they're all found in the Western hemisphere. Um, there's none that are found in the old world as it's referred to. Um, those are sunbirds that kind of take, take the ecological niche of hummingbirds. Um, so let's dive into some things. So we got um, a velvet purple coronet. I showed that in my last presentation, but this is a different look. We have a white neck Jacobin here, um, adult male ruby topaz. This is another coppery rumped hummingbird. This is a female tufted coquette, an adult male black throated mango. Um, I believe this is a gorgeted wood star or um, a gorgeous, excuse me, this is a gorgeous sun angel, excuse me. Um, and this is a Gould's jewel front. So eight different hummingbird species of the 360. And as you can see here from their names, they have pretty extravagant names. So hummingbirds in North America. Well, we're going to start out because hummingbird biodiversity is not created equally. And just like we talked about in my last presentation, um, biodiversity in the new world tropics is ridiculous. Um, so let's look at some numbers. Canada, and this is not like, you know, crazy rare birds that were like reported one time ever or two times ever. I'm talking about like more, more than not, like 95% bell curve. Like these are numbers that fall within the bell curve. So Canada has around five species. US has 27. Um, Mexico has 59 species. So if you just see the trending as we're getting farther south, you can only imagine what's going to happen when we hit these like epic Central American and uh, South American hotspots. So hummingbirds by country in Central America. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the map of Central America, that's okay. These are very small countries, but do not let their size fool you. Um, their size is not proportional to their biodiversity. So as we look at these numbers flying onto the screen, um, again, we can see a relative trend uh, heading toward um, quite high numbers in these zones here in Costa Rica and Panama, 
But even a country as small as Belize has a whopping 22 species, which is significantly more than Canada. So now let's watch things get interesting in South America. Colombia has 165 species of hummingbirds. Is that insane? Some people haven't even seen this many birds in their whole life. Um, Ecuador, like we talked about, is 133. Um, Peru has 125. Venezuela, 99. I'm not going to read them all, but you can see that um, the trend continues to kind of peak in this central area, and then it starts to kind of taper as we get farther south. Um, obviously, if it was like adjusted for size of the country, it might be a little bit different in terms of the number or like the weighting. But again, this isn't like a statistical, this is not environmental statistics or whatever. This is a hummingbird presentation. So there we go. Um, the next thing that's important to understand about hummingbirds is a little bit about their evolutionary history. And so they're actually most closely related to swift. So if we look at this uh, cladogram or like a evolutionary tree, we can see Trochilidae, which is the hummingbird family, um, is adjacent to, um, so they're all in apodiforms, but it branches and there's a podi with tree swifts and like regular swifts and then branches out into the hummingbirds. Um, here's a visual for y'all. Um, okay, and then you may be wondering, oh really? Like, is he just saying things? Um, sometimes I do, but it's not true in this case. Um, so there's some evidence of a 52 million year old fossil found in Europe, which basically was um, conclusive evidence of the commonalities in what we call like, I believe vest or homologous structures that are basically like overlapping, indicating evolutionary past. And so um, each of these little diagrams uh, are signaling the areas that overlap between the swifts and the hummingbirds, um, including like very short tarsus, right? Hummingbirds and swifts are not made for walking. Um, and there's a couple other things that I'm not gonna go into, but you can too, if you're interested. Um, the paper is down here at all. <laughs> Again, not sure if I pronounced it right. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that are unique about hummingbirds and that are found, um, found within hummingbirds. So one common feature is that they are sexually dimorphic. Um, and if we break that down, di means two, so kind of two different kind of appearances or colors or whatever. Um, and so up top here, we have a male booted racket tail. Um, and I showed this actually species in the last presentation, but if you remember, um, that was a Western one. And these are the Eastern slope of the Andes um, where they have actually like orange tufts instead of white tufts. But the main point here is that this is the same species. Um, this is a female here, and this is a male up top and you can see it doesn't have the racket like the male does. Um, another great example of sexual dimorphism um, is between the ruby topazes, right? The male's got this like ridiculous gorget and uh, crown feathers um, and the little lady is much more drab. Um, the next thing that's important to understand about hummingbirds is that they are specialized nectarivores. They have literally evolved to do what they do. It wasn't just by accident it maybe was by accident millions of years ago, but is not the case anymore. Um, and that they actually have a co-evolution with ornithifolius flowers, which means orna, birds, the folius, um, I believe, love. So like bird loving flowers. So they've co-evolved with flowers. Um, don't believe me? Look at this trumpet plant or angel plant, I forget what it's called. But as you can see, it has a really long, um, I believe the term is corolla. Um, and so what the hummingbirds are actually getting, it's not the pollen that they're getting. They're actually in it for the nectar, which is at the base of the flower. But here are these huge um, anthers covered in pollen, which are obviously like the male reproductive parts of the plant. We don't need to go into that. It's, this is a bird presentation. But regardless, you can see that form and function happen together. Um, and these plants and birds are co-evolved. This is a sword-billed hummingbird, by the way. Um, and in the tropics, there are 7,000 plant species pollinated by hummingbirds. Um, and many of which are actually like um, 
pollinated exclusively by those hummingbirds. Um, and if we compare that total to North America, um, there's only 125 flowers that are like obligatory, like obligative, that they have a direct relationship and that they need hummingbirds to pollinate them. So now we're gonna dive a little bit into hummingbird biology and some of their adaptations. Um, for those of you wondering, this is a, This is the type of sylph. This is the other one that I showed before. There was a violet tailed, and maybe there's like a green tailed, or no, no, it's long tailed and violet tailed sylph. So this is the long tailed sylph. Another one was the violet tailed sylph, I believe. Um, so a little food for thought, no pun intended. If our bodies ran the same way as hummingbirds, we'd have to eat roughly like 1,300 sandwiches, um, which is kind of insane. Um, but the question is, what do they eat? Now, we did say that they are specialized nectarivores, um, but that's not all they eat. They do consume a lot of nectar, that is for sure. Um, and there's a couple ways that they get their nectar. One example um, that you might commonly see here in Southern California is territory defending. Um, they'll basically sit on a perch and they'll chase all the other birds away. Very straightforward. Um, another example is called trap lining. Um, and so um, this is a white tip sickle bill from a good buddy, um, an amazing human, all things um, photographer, conservationist, et cetera, et cetera, um, Sean Gracer. But at any rate, this is a white tip sickle bill. And these hummingbirds do something that's called trap lining. Um, different than trap music, trap lining is basically instead of um, baby, basically, um, sitting perched or like hovering over your territory, um, this decreases competition because um, you're actually creating a paper route, so to speak, in the jungle um, or, or within your range. And so you hit like maybe 20 plants every hour and you go A, B, C, D, D, F, G, H, whatever. And then you're just doing loops so that um, instead of just sitting and waiting for the nectar refill, you go here. And then while that one's refilling, you go to the next one, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I did just get this lifer in Costa Rica on my last trip, which was very exciting. I've been waiting a long time for that bird. So just had to share that excitement. Um, here's another example. This is a heliconia and this is a, a green hermit. Um, hermits are very common trap liners and they love heliconias. Um, but a common misconception around hummingbirds is that they're actually not exclusively nectarivores, right? Um, they actually eat other things. Um, and so here's a little video from tracyportraits.com of just that exactly. So here, if you're not able to see it, um, this little lady is observing and then this little gnat, and then she sees it, she tees up on it, and she fly catches it. Um, examples of other food sources for hummingbirds are mosquitoes, um, ants, I don't know why it's showing that. I don't want that. At any rate, y'all know what <laughs> gnats and aphids look like. So these are four other common food sources for mosquito or for hummingbirds. Um, and sometimes hummingbirds actually hawk insects, which means they like snag them out of spider webs. Um, but in this case, this this hummingbird got totally caught by this orb weaver. Um, another really smart and uh, clever behavior is sap well visiting. So most folks probably recognize this is a woodpecker. This is a, a red-breasted sap sucker. Unless there's any hybrid experts in the room, you can make your case <laughs> in an email <laughs> um, for otherwise. But regardless, sap, sap suckers excavate small BB-sized holes in trees, um, kind of following a horizontal trend, so to speak, and they're excavating to get the sap to start flowing, which is sugary. Um, we'll, we'll dive into that later. Um, but hummingbirds, when this when the sap sucker is gone, will actually visit sap wells and lap up some of that sugar rich um, liquid. Um, the next thing that we're going to talk about is how they achieve their amazing flying, because hummingbirds are actually the only animal in the world that can fly 360 degrees up, down, backwards, like zigzag, whatever. It's all good. Um, now, I slowed it down here in the middle, and I don't know if I slowed it down enough, but I was trying to exemplify uh, their flight pattern. But 
basically how they fly is that when their upstroke and their downstroke are generating enough lift to keep the bird in flight. And so when, even when they're going down and up, they're creating, they're like able to hover. Um, and so it's basically like a figure eight flight. And so that's what allows them to have such amazing um, flying abilities. Um, that video was taken at UC Santa Cruz Arboretum for anybody <laughs> who's been up there to shoot hummingbirds that now is actually a good, really good time. Um, anyway, um, a next thing about their biology and, adap and adaptations, oops, I don't know what happened, um, is, is their tongues, right? This is a white neck Jacobin um, on Trinidad and Tobago, and they have pretty amazingly long tongues. Um, and I wanted to share just a little bit about that because more often than not, these are some of the marvels of nature that elude us until we slow things down. So enjoy this video courtesy of PBS and KCET. Grow photography, we see something truly new. <laughs> Hummingbirds' long tongues have four tips that open as the tongue dips into the nectar. A fringe of tiny filaments uncurls along the edges of the open tips, creating grooves that spring open, filling the tongue with nectar. It's a structure science has never seen before, and it's an incredibly efficient technology for picking up a liquid. It was Alejandro's resourcefulness and the painstaking work he began. <laughs> pretty, pretty crazy. So I'll just slide it back there. So what this is saying is that the hummingbird tongue is actually bifurcated and it has almost what look like cilia, um, which are these kind of like long flagellate like appendages, which serve to increase the overall surface area um, to allow them to lap up more sugar um, or more nectar. Um, so now that we've now that we've done the, <laughs> the one another aspect of their adaptations, their tongue, um, the next one we're going to talk about is their adaptations for sight. Um, so vision plays um, a critical role in hummingbird feeding and their hovering behavior. Um, and long story short, it actually has to do with their high retinal neuron density. Um, what that basically means is there's a lot of cells in their retinal, in their retina. Um, and so if you've ever seen a hummingbird, which I'm sure most people have, they are incredible flyers and they zip in, they zip out, they duck, they dive, they fly really high and they come bomb back down. And even in the, especially in like dense um, understory forests where they're going to pollinate or like they're going to hit bromeliads and other flowers and they're just like zipping through the forest. I and mean, it's like um, very, very tight tight corners, so to speak, um, it's because these birds have such a high retinal neuron density um, that allows them to see um, and adapt extremely rapidly to stimuli. So we're not going to get so deep into that because it's it's a pretty dense topic, but we'll keep it going. Um, okay, so retinal neurons, they serve to transform the optical image. So like what the bird is seeing and able to extract biologically relevant information, um, specifically in regards to light intensity changes in, and changes in time and chromacity. So it's basically <laughs> helping the hummingbirds do what they do. Um, we hit that one. All right, so we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, for hummingbirds, for us to have the same metabolism as hummingbirds, um, we'd have to eat like 1,300 sandwiches. Um, I barely have time in the day to make three meals. So that's a lot of time. Um, so a couple of things to understand is while in flight, hummingbirds have literally the fastest metabolism of any animal other than insects. Um,
Benny, this is Chris. I think we lost your sound. Oh, no, there's no sound in there. Okay. Thank you, though. Yeah, so I was just, I, so these are three. Let's go back. Oops. Um, so those are just three little clips that I wanted to demonstrate, like the, the physical energy required for hummingbirds to do what they do. Um, the first video was shot on a DSLR on a tripod head um, at Tondayapa Bird Lodge in Ecuador. Um, the second video was uh, a GoPro set up on a mount um, at Cuffey River in Tobago. Um, and then this is an iPhone on a tripod mount in slow-mo um, again at Tondayapa. Okay, so back to North America. Um, so this is actually a really interesting thing. So the birds have an extremely high, these birds have an extremely high metabolism, which is essential to supporting their rapid wing beats, right? It's all connected. So um, blue-throated hummingbirds have actually been observed in a study um, with a heart rate possible of 1,260 beats per minute and up to 250 breaths per minute, um, which is insane. Um, so if we take it into a little bit of context, so when we exercise, we need to have oxygen, right? That's transporting to our body and to our muscle cells, et cetera, et cetera. So if we're comparing um, oxygen consumption per muscle gram of tissue between hummingbirds and between elite athletes, like someone like Usain Bolt, for example, um, hummingbirds are still consuming 10 times more oxygen than an elite athlete. So what's going on like um, homeostatically and metabolically and like biochemically, like hummingbirds are insane, insane. And this oxygen consumption is, is critical because we're going to be going up to um, we're going to be going up to the summit where oxygen is um, <laughs> in short supply, let's say. So let's keep things going as we talk about maintenance of the metabolism. So how the heck do they do that? Well, the direct answer is, well, I'm sorry, the answer is direct oxidation. Um, and what that means basically is that when hummingbirds are consuming um, nectar, they're actually able to convert that into energy, which is like the sugar, if you remember from high school biology, sugar is converted into adenosine triphosphate, which is basically um, through, I believe through glycolysis, um, in which the bonds are broken, and then the cells can use the energy from the broken, maybe covalent bonds or something. But long story short, these hummingbirds can basically melt that sugar into energy and they can convert it into 30, um, in up to 30 to 45 minutes. Um, that's why hummingbirds have to feed um, very frequently. Um, this is a ruby topaz hummingbird. This is a male. Um, yeah, cool photo. <laughs> um, so, it isn't only just burned off though, right? This is an immature male and his hummingbird actually from Slow County. Um, and we're gonna talk about this idea that it's not just burned off, okay? Um, sometimes it's actually stored as fat. So our first case study of this evening is the ruby-throated hummingbird, um, images courtesy of my buddy, uh, Sean. So let's meet the ruby-throated hummingbird. Now, I'm sure not everybody's from California originally, or you've probably seen a ruby-throated hummingbird if you spent any time east of the Rockies. Um, here is the rough range of the ruby-throated hummingbird on kind of like the eastern part of the country, um, again, generally. So the next thing that we're talking about is migration, okay? And so these birds make their way to their wintering grounds in Central America and Southern Mexico, and they fly, it turns out. They fly 500 miles of, across the open ocean through the Gulf of Mexico. Before, and before that, they fly thousands of miles from here, and their journey is not even over yet once they get to, uh, once they touch land. So in this case study, we're examining birds that maybe they're coming from New York or whatever, and then they flew across the Gulf, and then once they got to the Yucatan, they basically started flying, um, and eventually where we're going next in our journey um, is the Nicoya Peninsula of Northwest Costa Rica. Um, and that distance from there to there is like another 500 miles. So they fly thousands of miles. And these ruby-throated hummingbirds weigh roughly like this, the weight of a penny or three and a half grams. Like they're extremely lightweight. Um, and so I was fortunate 
no, 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 no. <laughs> I was fortunate enough to participate in a, a bird banding research project in Costa Rica in 2013. And we were targeting birds whose populate, we were targeting neotropical migrants whose populations um, had been seeing a decline due to um, habitat loss and a variety of other factors. And so we would ban the birds. As you can see here, there's a little bit of bling, little jewelry, um, and we would ban the birds. And this individual bird um, was banded three years prior to its recapture, which means that this bird had made six one-way journeys back and forth, back and forth without dying. So <laughs> that's pretty incredible. And after we ban them, the hummingbirds are a little bit chill, and then they dip out. But the ruby-throated hummingbird is not the only bird that migrates. And uh, the next place we're going is, is to the sea. And one place in particular where you might not expect a hummingbird to live. Filled with Arctic terns and bald eagles and orcas is Alaska. Now, hummingbirds in Alaska, you wonder? Indeed. A good thought. Um, thank you to Brian Small for this fantastic photo of a Rufus hummingbird, as well as to Brian Kalk. So Rufus hummingbirds are what we call long distance migrants. Um, as the name suggests, they fly quite a ways. Um, they can fly roughly 4,000 miles from Mexico uh, to Northwest Canada and Alaska. Um, Excuse me. So you can see here the key down below. This is um, a color key. So you can see kind of what, whatever, breeding, migration, non breeding. So here's the Rufus hummingbird. Now, what's so interesting about the Rufus hummingbird is that it has a really close relationship with two special flowers. Um, so right here we have a range map of. A very cool flower. Um, colloquially, colloquially, it's known as the Indian paintbrush. Um, to botanists or naturalists um, or ecologists, this is a type of paintbrush without the Indian part. Um, the genus is Castileja. Um, and then we're looking at one species in particular here. Um, and uh, this is the range map. So you can see this is southeastern Alaska. Um, this is southeastern Alaska. And here's the Kenai Peninsula. And then here's you know, obviously what it is. Um, and now what I'm overlapping on top of that is actually the Rufus hummingbirds range map. So let's look at it again. So here's the, the, the paintbrush. And then slowly you can see there's actually very similar overlap between the range of the Rufus and the paintbrush. Um, and that's by, that's, that's not a coincidence over time as one thing that I didn't mention is that all hummingbirds are tropical in their origin. They emanated from warm tropical regions. And as the climate changed after the last glacial period, like roughly 10,000 years ago, um, temperatures have increased and creating more favorable conditions for hummingbirds. Um, obviously other birds right now, I have like vermilion flycatchers like at a local patch. And back in the day, I'd have to go to like Southeast Arizona to go see them. So everybody knows that bird ranges are capable of changing, shifting, expanding. Um, on a very sh short temporal scale. Um, the other flower that these birds have a very close relationship with is uh, Western Columbine. I'm sure you guys have seen these if you've been into the Sierra um, or into like some of the transverse ranges here, or maybe they have them in the coast range um, in Morro Bay County or in San Luis Obispo County, but these are Aculasia formosa, Western Columbine. Um, and at just three, let's listen to this. At just three inches long and weighing little more than a penny, this female Rufus hummingbird has flown over 3,000 miles from Mexico to nest in southeast Alaska. No other hummingbird breeds this far north. Males play no part in raising their young. She's raised this chick all on her own. Hatched from an egg the size of a jelly bean, in just three weeks, she's already outgrown the nest.
insane. So somebody else said it, so you know I'm not lying. Um, oopsies. So we talked a little bit about it before, about the relationship between um, red-breasted sapsuckers, for example, and, and hummingbirds. So take a look at this footage of a red-breasted sapsucker in Alaska, because their relationship is, is really interesting. A red-breasted sapsucker. He's carefully chiseling holes in the tree trunk so the tree's sweet syrup leaks out. He'll be back later to feed once the sap is flowing well. It's the chance the hummingbird has been waiting for. She just needs to get in unnoticed while the sapsucker is busy at another tree. It's all about timing. The sugary sap is starting to overflow. It's now or never. Her tongue curls, grasping the sap, licking it in at nine sips a second. Whoopsie daisy. <laughs> let's let's cut back to where we were. Power point. All right, we got this. Third time's a charm. Licking it in at nine sips a second. She can drink more than her body weight every day. Over the next three weeks, she'll be back regularly to pilfer this store. Crazy. Thank you to BBC Earth. Alrighty. So in summation, Rufus Hummingbird, a long distance migrant, 4,000 miles. This is the most northerly breeding hummingbird in the entire world. And <laughs> I spent two summers guiding in Alaska, and this was a photograph I took in May. Now, May <laughs> in Alaska looks and feels very different than May in Southern California. In Los Angeles, where I live, in May, you have to start heading into elevation to start to see uh, wildflower blooms continue. My first summer guiding in Alaska, I got there and I was like, oh, you guys get flowers up here? <laughs> it was because this northern latitude takes so much longer to heat up because of its um because of its angle and how the sun is. I could get into that a little bit more, but I'm not an expert on that topic. But basically the earth's position, it takes longer for it to heat up, right? Like it starts at the equatorial region, then it slowly starts to warm up. So sometimes when birds are migrating, there might be conditions that are very different than where they started migrating from. And so even in Alaska, where these conditions are variable or it slowly gets warmer, there can still be really like cold nights and hummingbirds have to cope with that. Even if it's in July or August, there could be still a squall or a snowfall or like a really long stretch of rain and the temps drop significantly. And so um, hummingbirds, like the Rufus hummingbird, have unique adaptations um, to maintain homeostasis, even when the ambient air temperature is extremely low. Um, and they do that by um, doing something called uh, nighttime torpor. Um, it's basically like hibernation, but a little bit different. Um, and these birds can drop their temp from 104 degrees to 64. So basically it's like saving energy when you turn down your thermostat. So <laughs> this is actually a really interesting interesting image from David Sibley's uh, guide to bird behavior or North guide. Here we go. Uh, Sibley guide to bird behavior of North America. So um, these are all flowers. Obviously, these are all hummingbirds. But the point here is that each of these flowers are actually positioning their pollen in a unique place so that the pollen doesn't get all mixed up with other pollen and that it gets to the right place on the right time. 
So if we look at fuchsia flowers, for example, the pollen deposited the, the pollen deposits on like the chin of the hummingbird. Uh, when we look at fuchsias, it's more like wrapped around the bill, or excuse me, pinks, um, like a uh, cardinal catchfly, um, uh, Silene genus. Uh, I think the family is Caryophyllaceae. Um, but any rate, you can see it's deposited on the beak. Um, and then here it's deposited like on the forecrown with uh, the ocotillos, right? If you go down to like uh, our southeastern deserts of the state, like uh, go to see Joshua Tree. Um, uh, what's the other one? Any anyway, rate, moving on. Um, and Chuparosa. So ugh. the main point here is that flowers are crazy smart and that they have figured out the best way for hummingbirds to do their bidding. And it's a mutual exchange, right? The hummingbirds get nectar. Um, and the flowers get their pollen uh, distributed. All right, now we're getting into the fun part um, and where we're gonna elevate the conversation here a little bit. So this is a great sapphire wing and now we're um, back on the summit. So we just went from sea and now we're to summit. Um, this is high elevation in the Andes Mountains in Northwest Ecuador. Um, and like we mentioned earlier, um, some of the stressors or challenges for living in higher elevation are the lower atmospheric oxygen levels. So this photo was captured at 9,000 feet. Um, let's refer to our handy dandy altimeter um, with its correlating uh, oxygen levels. So we pop in down to 9,000 and we compare this number from sea level, which is like roughly 21% available oxygen, right? It's not all air oxygen that we're breathing. Most of it is nitrogen. Um, and some other gases, but regardless, um, it's right around 15% at 9,000 and then roughly 21% at, at sea level. All right, well, that's not too bad. Fiery throated hummingbird, this is from the central highlands of, uh, of Costa Rica. Again, the same number, 15,000. But the rainbow bearded thornbill, which I observed um, at around, I think, 10, 5 or 11. Um, but in this case, we're just looking at its peak range. So in LA County, Mount Baldy, this is the highest peak in my county. Um, I definitely don't have hummingbirds at the peak, but at 12,000 feet, we've roughly lost like 7% of available oxygen, which if there's only 20% or 21% available to lose 7% is, is substantial. Um, now the giant hummingbird, this is what, um, for, if you were with us in our last prez, um, I was talking about what a what an interesting bird is quite large. It has a very different flight, um, but what we're focusing on here is that it's found literally at sea level all the way up to almost 15,000 feet. Sea level to 15,000 feet, one species is able to persist and survive despite, despite this huge elevational difference. Now, how much oxygen is available at 15,000? It's like almost half, almost cut by a factor of 50%. So how do they do it? I mean, we talked about this, right? They're consuming 10 times, 10 times more oxygen per gram of muscle tissue than elite athletes. But yet they're at sometimes elevations where there's only 50% of that oxygen is available. So what's the missing piece in the equation that's allowing them to do what they do? Um, Again, it's a little bit technical, but basically the, the hemoglobin has enhanced oxygen binding properties. So take, for example, humans, right? We have a type of hemoglobin um, that maybe binds to two oxygen molecules and the hemoglobin is found within our red blood cells. But take hummingbirds, for example, their hemoglobin might actually allow them to bind, each hemoglobin cell might be able to bind to like eight or 10 oxygen molecules. So basically it's cramming more oxygen, um, more available oxygen per gram of muscle tissue um, than many other organisms so that they can pull from that without like, um, without running out of oxygen basically. So really, really fascinating. All right, um, another thing that hummingbirds are obviously quite famous for is their feather iridescence. Um, how does that happen? Well, good question. Um, <laughs> another kind of technical one, but at its most simple level, um, light is refracting through microscopic structures of the feather barbule. So I'm sure many folks have seen uh, the dark side of the moon cover in which uh, the light, which is in the form of white light, is refracting through, through the prism and creating um, 
a what is allowing us to see a wider spectrum of colors in the visible light spectrum. Um, that's basically what's happening. Each of these um, feather barbules has microscopic prisms that are tuned to like a certain wavelength. And so it absorbs the visible light and then it refracts it out based on like the microscopic structure of these of these cells um, in the feathers themselves. So very trippy, but very interesting. It's basically has to do with the sun refracting through these microscopic cells and then how it looks at us, the viewing angle can change the color of the appearance. Obviously, if you've seen like an Anna's hummingbird, you look at it in the shade and it looks like a black throated hummingbird or whatever. Um, and then you see it turn a certain way and it's like whole face lights up with like magenta pink and then it turns like slightly the other way and then you get like a little more like pink fuchsia. So it's, it's really interesting. All right, taking things back home. We're all in California, or at least this is where our festival is gonna be um, right here. And we can reliably observe six different species in California, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, here's an Anna's hummingbird, like we talked about. It's got that kind of fuchsia pink um, gorget and also like head feathers. This is an adult male. The female hummingbirds we're gonna kind of stay away from because that's beyond the scope of tonight's presentation. That's kind of an advanced topic. Um, here's an Allen's hummingbird. This is a female in this case, but Allen's are actually pretty easy to tell. Um, these Allen's hummingbirds have I'm sure many folks know, but those of you who don't, um, the Allens have orange and green on the back for the most part. Um, and this is a California native plant. This is a golden current. Um, here's a Rufus hummingbird. One of the most diagnostic features of a Rufus hummingbird um, is that it has an all orange back. Um, there may be some hardcore birders out there who want to share about the the uh, green backed Rufus hummingbird population, which roughly 20% of the individuals have um, up here, similar to the uh, Allen's hummingbird. So for rough strokes, you can generally assume that if you're looking at a hummingbird with no green on its back, it's a Rufus hummingbird. Um, and if you're seeing a hummingbird with some green on its back, it's likely an Allen's. Um, the most definitive way is basically to see the bird in flight and measuring the extent of white in the tail feathers and the rectrices. But again, that is like beyond the scope of tonight's presentation. Um, the next up is the Calliope hummingbird. This is a very small hummingbird. I believe it's North America's smallest hummingbird and just a bit larger than the bee hummingbird, which is the world's smallest in Cuba. Um, and it's got this kind of wine colored gorget. Um, and one thing that's diagnostic is not only the size, but um, the gorget feathers are not complete. Like there's still non iridescent feathers in the throat. And as you can see, um, it doesn't kind of cut off. It flares down um, along the edges. Um, here's the black chinned hummingbird. Um, the whole gorget here is actually black, is, is black and then it goes purple. Um, these are a little bit more desert. Um, here's the Costa's hummingbird. These two can kind of be mixed up um, at first glance, especially if you get like a poor look, um, especially because they both have purple on their head and throat. Uh, but the Costa's hummingbird has these flared, gorg like the gorget flares out on the side also, kind of like a shield. So look out for that if you're if you're not sure. Um, all right, I always have a conservation message, obviously, um, and I'm actually doing pretty good on time. Okay, so what is crazy popular right now, and for good reason, is native plant landscaping. Um, and what that means is that planting plants that are regionally appropriate, which means that prior to colonization, before, you know, colonists came to North America, things were very different, right? That was like all but 400 years ago. Things were like bountiful and booming and the indigenous peoples who lived on this land and who still live on this land had bounty like they had surplus and now um the environment's been degraded like extraordinarily and i don't think that's a mystery to pretty much anybody i'm not going to get on the soapbox super hard here um because i'm sure i'm preaching to the choir but regardless um a huge movement that's happening across the world but also like specifically in california is planting plants that are supposed to be where we were, right? Like before it was houses, um, at least in my area, it was orchards and oranges. And before that it was like ranchos and missions. And before that was basically natural landscape that was tended and uh, managed through uh, indigenous practices, what we call traditional ecological knowledge. Now we've gotten pretty far away from that. Um, but one thing that we can do is re-naturalizing some of the spaces that we live because 
Um, in my last slide, we basically have lost like 3 billion birds or whatever since 1970. And a large part of that is because the same resources aren't available to birds and the, the ecosystems are fragmenting, right? Like the grizzly bear is extinct in California. California condor was on the brink of extinction. Insects have like, you know, experienced a tremendous collapse population wise. So again, preaching to the choir, I'm sure you all know this, but I am going to hammer it home and that a lot of folks think or don't know that you can actually have a really beautiful yard or outdoor space or community area or sidewalk that features our native plants and that has blooms um, throughout the year. And so I took the liberty of including some slides um, and some corresponding flowers or plants um, that bloom during certain times of the year. So for our January and March right now, um, a lot of our chaparral and coastal sage scrub communities are basically waking up. This is like spring, like winter in SoCal is basically like springtime for much of the world, right? We go through basically a five month drought period um, and then it starts to rain and then things start happening, fresh growth. So we have um, some favorites for hummingbirds. These are some currants. This is like Gracilaraceae family. These are ribes. We have a golden current and then we have a chaparral current, ribes malvasium. These are great um, in terms of cacti, if you're more like on that vibe. Um, we have some beaver tail cactus, um, different apuntias. Um, and then if you are like myself and you love, <laughs> if you love uh, coastal sage scrub and chaparral plants, um, these, uh, these mimulus or the old name is mimulus, they're now depactus, but these are monkey flowers. They come in different colors. Um, they're really cool. Uh, June through August. So we have some salvias, which are like in the mint family. Um, we have a hummingbird pitcher, pitcher sage down below, which is, as the name alludes, a favorite of hummers. This is also another one. I think this is purple sage. This is a hummingbirds go crazy for this. And it also attracts a lot of pollinators, bugs, and insects. Um, penstemons. This is heartleaf cacalia. This is like one that grows near me in LA. Um, here's another penstemon. This is showy penstemon. I think penstemon spectabilis if I'm not mistaken. Um, here's some more thistles. We do have some invasive thistles, but we actually do have some that are native. Um, and I'm sure some folks feed birds at home using niger seed. This is just thistle seed basically. So um, during different stages of the plant's life, um, it serves different purposes to different organisms. Um, and another cool one is snapdragons. These are island bush snapdragons. But again, the most important thing is not only buying native plants that are from California, but purchasing and installing native plants that are regionally appropriate. Meaning we're not gonna plant stuff that's out from the Channel Islands in our yards. We're gonna plant stuff um, that's actually growing in the adjacent area um, or in the nearby foothills, et cetera, et cetera, to support the animals and plants that have evolved here for literally thousands of years. Um, no space to plant, no problem. Um, we do have other ways to attract hummingbirds to your yard. Um, hummingbird feeders are a favorite. There's a lot of different options. Even if you are space limited like this, you could live in an apartment. Um, and these are a cool thing, the little suction cup, and there's like a little water moat so that ants don't get in there. Um, and uh, that's a cool thing. And also doubles as a, as a signaler for birds that this is a glass window. Um, they don't fly into it. Um, and maybe you're remembering this presentation. You're like, yeah, yeah, I want to get fired up on feeding hummingbirds because I love them. And you go by your pet store and you see this beautiful red bottle of premium concentrate. And you're kind of a sucker for, for top shelf purchases. And the premium really got you there. Or maybe perhaps you're you're a big patriot and you love the red nectar mix that has the American flag on it. Or perhaps you are a big Petco shopper and you were getting some things and you saw this beautiful red bottle of hummingbird nectar. But then you thought to yourself, wow, that was such a fantastic presentation about hummingbirds and not using red dye premix. Um, is there a solution? Yes, there is a solution. You can make your own, believe it or not. Um, this is my great, 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 great grandmother's so, uh, nectar solution. So don't tell anybody unless they want to attract hummingbirds. So it's basically a 20% nectar solution, which means one to four. Um, for those of you who are mathematically challenged, this is five total parts. So it is actually 20%. So it's one fifth, even though it's a one to four ratio. Um, I learned that recently. Um, most important thing is to use warm water to evenly dissolve the sugar. It doesn't have to be boiling. Um, but you want the sugar to really dissolve evenly. So you can like heat it up pretty hot and then mix it until um, it's fully dissolved. Um, 
another one important thing to keep in mind is that um, if anyone has ever seen like oranges or fruit on the ground ferment, um, the sugar gets colic, it's called. Um, the same thing can happen to your feeders if you don't change them frequently or the temperature increases like in the summertime. So when it's hot out, I recommend like paying attention to your feeders frequently, but like a good rule of thumb is like every three days you can refresh it. Um, on cooler temperatures, you can kind of play it by ear and maybe that timeline can be extended a little bit further. Um, if you've enjoyed this presentation, feel free to check me out on my website, birdsbybeaches.com, on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. Um, I have actually some educational adventures on there as well. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you all for having me, all 209 participants. This might just be the largest virtual audience I've ever um, presented before. So I humbly say thank you all for, for your attention. I know everybody was totally quiet and not talking at home, but uh, thank you everybody. And I'm gonna mute and take off my share screen. All right, hey, Benny, that was amazing. Uh, can you hear everybody say 